afternoon. It is the uh, 23rd of August. It's a Sunday and I've had quite a busy weekend and today I decided to continue to read. Uh, I'm reading Prelude to the Landing on Planet Earth. It's a book written by Stuart Holroyd and it was published in 1977 and it is a uh, journey of discovery. Um, I believe it's a true story but it is a good yarn, that's for sure. Whether it is true or not remains to the reader to decide. Um, I've read it before, about a decade ago, and I don't know how I could forget about it. It seemed relevant at the time, but uh, my life was very busy. And how things go, I didn't continue anything with it. I read it and was amazed. So now I've read uh, a question and answers uh, from the same group of people. And this is actually the prelude to the book I have already read uh, on the YouTube and live stream. Today I'm reading uh, chapter four and it's entitled Exits. The sentences are long, a little convoluted. I'm doing my best because I do it live. So, Among the precursors of the New Age consciousness and orientation was Dr. Roberto Asadilio, Asad, Asadili who shortly after the turn of the century started to develop the concepts and techniques of psychokinesis, psychosynthesis. All through the decades, when the majority of psychologists following Freud focused their attention on the pathology of the psyche and on the development of techniques of therapy that sought to adjust individuals to a socio-cultural norm, Asad Jili worked in comparative obscurity developing his integrative model of the psyche and techniques of individual growth. That he was indeed ahead of his time would seem to be indicated by the following quotation from a letter of a letter from Freud to Jung, written in April 1909. I shake my wise grey locks over the question of psychosynthesis and I think, well, that is how the young folk are. They really enjoy things only when they need not drag us along with them. Where with, where with our short breath and weary legs, we cannot follow. As Lancelot Law Wright, Wright, Wright has written, Freud conflict in the psyche, and he should be followed by the genius of order in the organism illustrated in the human mind. The last phrase precisely defines a Sigilis contribution, which has been increasingly appreciated and implemented in the past decade when on account of the loosening of the hold of social cultural orthodoxies and the awakened interest in consciousness expansion, adjustment therapy had been seen in its true light and growth psychology has come into its own. Robert Asigili was 86 in the summer of 1974 when Diane Bacchetti went to work with him. When I went to Italy, Diana said, I was going to learn psycho psychosynthesis and what I realized when I died, when he died, was that I had been sent to serve Roberto in the last months of his life, to bring him joy and contact and humanness for his last month on earth. Because of his physical frailty, it had been months since he had agreed to take on a new student, though many had sought the privilege, but Diana went to him with the recommendation of Dr. Piero Ferrucci his most loyal and brilliant ex-student, who normally worked with him but was spending the summer in California with his friend Laura Huxley, wife of the late Aldous Huxley. Ferrucci's, Ferrucci's recommendation helped, but this alone does not explain Asigili's taking her into his, into his life. There was a contact at depth from their first meeting the previous October, and now Roberto knew that Diana had not come to take from him but to give. Everyone around him, even his housekeeper and the secretary who had worked for him for 25 years or so, tended to regard him as an eminent greasy, to the very deferential and always addressed him as Dr. Asiliji. His wife had died the year before and his only son married years ago and Diana sensed that he was a lonely man who needed human contact, warmth and affection. He was spending the summer in his villa in, in, his villa in Capalona in the hills of Tuscany between Florence and Rome. The Institutio di Psychonietesi had premises in Florence, about which 
he had an apartment and in the summer months moved out to Capuolona where for many years students had visited him in his big old house known as the Villa Lanusa. About two years ago someone had built a Sigili, a modern villa, on top of a hill overlooking Capuolona, which he named Villa Iario, in memory of his son. And here, here he now lived with his housekeeper, Carmela, and his manservant, Dante. As the Villa Lanusa was empty, he suggested that Diana should live in it during her stay, and early in June she moved in. Capalona itself is a rather unattractive small town. The streets are unpaved, and there's a cement factory on its outskirts, as it lies in a valley. It's very hot and dusty in the summer. For Diana to walk past the outskirts of Capalona, as she did daily, then up the hill towards the Villa Ilario, was always something of a symbolic journey, a progress from the squalid and the mundane to the higher levels of the spiritual. She would arrive about 11 o'clock every morning. Ella was always busy in the kitchen, whence emanated homely smells of cooking. Roberto would be waiting in his study, a slight, frail man with white hair and beard. He always made a point of dressing elegantly, in a velvet smoking jacket of which he had several different colours and a clean white shirt and a tie. His study was an expression of the man, of his ideas and his loves. The furniture was sturdy and antique and there were shelves full of books on every wall. On his desk there was a small United Nations flag symbolising the unity of mankind and there were a number of rocks of inter interesting colour and of shape, including a large amethyst crystal. There were always fresh, fragrant roses in the room, for to him the rose was a symbol for the soul. And there were several antique vases and chalices symbolizing love. An artist's drawing of Mount Fuji, wreathed in cloud, and some enlarged photographs of the galaxies decorated the walls. The former a reminder of the heights the human spirit can attain, and the latter reminders of another perspective of human problems in relation to the immensity and magnificence of the universe. Wide, tall windows were open on warm days. They gave onto a veranda and commanded a view over the valley and several villages with terraced vineyards in the near distance and ranges of hills in the far. For a each morning, Roberto and Diana would work in his study. He would dictate letters to her, English or American correspondence, or they would spend time organizing material for a book he was composing on ways to sell as he sometimes called it, a textbook of height psychology. As he was deaf and could only be communicated with directly if you shouted at the top of your voice in Italian, as his servants did, which always amused Diana, for he was a man of great dignity and their shouting at him seemed so incongruous. She had to communicate with him by writing what she wished to say. After the morning's work, they would meditate together for about half an hour. Roberto always went so far out in his meditations, Diana said, that he had to have something to bring him back. And for the purpose, he used to have an egg timer that went off with a loud noise that it always made me jump out of my skin through. So him, to him, of course, it was just a gentle mute ping. But in spite of the egg timer, she says, meditating with Roberto was like magic. I always came out of it with a tremendous sense of joy and light, a great wonder and awe. In the afternoon, Roberto would rest and Diana would return to Villa Lanusa to work at or editing his papers. Then, at about five o'clock in the afternoon, she would go back to Villa Ilario for another two or three hours. Roberto would work with her on her own psychosynthesis, which would be followed by another period of meditation before Camilla served dinner. Day after day, they followed this routine and Diana knew that these weeks would be formative for her, that the experience of serving Roberto and learning from him would remain a cherished memory of her life. She looked forward to being able to share it with John when he came. John came to Italy from the Bahamas after a week stopover in London and stayed for three weeks with Diana in Villa Lanusa. He too had an experience to talk about and share. Diana knew little about the communications at this stage for when they had been together last for a period John had been heavily committed to the May lecture work and had given her only a vague idea of what he was otherwise involved in. But now he told her all, and what he told her aroused in her a profound mixed feeling and fear, in which fear predominated. Primarily, 
the awesome fear of the unknown, but also fear that he was being deceived, he was making a fool of himself, and fear for the future of their relationship, for she knew she would not be able to share his enthusiasm and his commitment to the extent that he might wish. John was eager to have Roberto in of the communications and wrote a long report of events and information received up to that time for him to read. Fortunately, he recorded the remarks Assigioli ma made after he had read the report. Assigioli spoke English well, but jerkily, and a high-pitched voice with pronounced Italian inflections, which makes the tape difficult to transcribe. But after listening to it several times, by phrase by phrase, I have been able to decipher the following interesting comments. This is a city. Very pleased with the report because of the agreement between the communications and my intuition is really remarkable. The main points should be a basis for our cooperation. Mediums are not always reliable because they are open to different influences. And they the point which I really doubt is that of a landing, a physical landing of these beings. As regards the new wave from 1979, uh, 1975 on, and the coming of higher beings, I think it will be a gradual thing. But the main point is the realization by humanity that there are higher beings which they are strangely reluctant to admit. I think that to help them to recognize that is good. It's one of the main esoteric teachings. The time has come for the recognition of that, of the hierarchy that is there. The only point of caution is that there are dark forces that try to prevent all this happening. And one of the ways is to insinuate false teaching in the communications. It is not so difficult for them, for they are sly. And under the guise of something fine, they can be misleading. So we must be on guard. Asiliji was well versed in the esoteric traditions and teachings, and he would speak of the hierarchy of higher beings and of the dark forces that opposed them with complete naturalness as if he had long ago accepted the reality of such entities. I shall have occasion to refer back to these remarks of his sigilly in later discussions of the communications, and I should like to bring to the reader's attention also a very relevant passage from the chapter titled Crises Caused by the Spiritual Awakening in his book Psychosynthesis. In some sensitive individuals there is a of Sarpara psychological perceptions. They have visions which they believe to be of exalted beings. They may hear voices or begin to write automatically, accepting the messages at their face value and obeying them unreserved, unreservedly. The quality of such messages is very varied. Sometimes they contain fine teachings, but they should always be examined with much discrimination and sound judgment and without being influenced by their uncommon origin or by any claim by their alleged transmitter. No validity should be attributed to messages containing death orders and commanding blight on Gideons, and to those tending to exalt the personality of the recipient. recipient. If we review the communications in the light of Asigili's comments, comments, both in this book and in response to John's report, we note that they cannot be faulted for commanding light obedience for the communicators repeatedly make the point that they never interfere with a per person's free will. Nor can they really be said to exalt the personalities of the recipients, for they stress that they are one of several groups in the world who have chosen to be in service, and also, as we, have, as we see later, lay particular emphasis on the fact that they are ordinary human beings. What is most interesting, of course, is that Asigili found nothing intrinsically preposterous in the idea of communications emanating from an extraterrestrial intelligence. What he said about the unreliability of mediums and the possibility of false teachings, teachings being insinuated into the communication must always be borne in mind when we attempt to assess this material. But it was a possibility that both Phyllis and Andritja were aware of. For Phyllis said to Andreja when they came out of the trance at the conclusion of the real channeling, are you sure that we are dealing with the right people? To a non-psychic who falls people involved in the psychic scene, it is impressive to find that they have a consensus reality. 
Intensely subjective, though psychic and spiritual experiences are, they belong to an area of human experience that has been well mapped and knowledge of the topography of this strange area, area is shared by psychic and psychologists. Freudian psychologists tend to lump psychic experiences together as a process of morbid or pathological mental states. And Jung and Astigili were pioneers in taking psychism seriously and studying the varieties of its manifestations. In conversation with me, Diana said of Asili, Asigili, he believed that certain things were lower psychism and certain things were higher, in the sense that lower psychism was astral projection, apathy, clairvoyant, mediumship, whereas higher psychism was intuition, illumination, inspiration, and he felt very much that if we tune into and focus all our attention on the lower aspects of psychism, we won't allow the higher development to occur. What worried Diana about the communications and John's involvement was that she felt that there was a good deal of lower psychism involved in them. Asigili had similar reservations, but he was genuinely interested in the communications and when John returned to Osinin in July, he promised to bring back to Italy a further report on what transpired in the next series of communications. He also promised to consult the management on the questions whether it would be in order for a healing to be attempted on Roberto. A Sigili had agreed to this on the condition that no attempt should be made to cure his deafness. For, he said, he had lived with that condition long enough to have learned that it had certain advantages. Phyllis was already in a sinning when John arrived on the 18th of July. Lily, Lyle was due to come on the 20th of July. Andrew said, they had already learned from the management that he had decided against getting more deeply involved in the work. At which he had held a communication alone with Phyllis the night before, in which Tom had said, Dr. Watson was given an opportunity and he declined. Many people ask, what can we do for mankind? And when we give them directions, they fail because they are afraid it will interfere. They ask, but they do not really mean it in their hearts. He may continue working if he desires, but we want you to remind him that he was given an opportunity. If he had said yes, he would not necessarily have had to do that project. We were asking for faith. He knew for the last three years that he would be involved in healing. Within his heart, his, this pleased him, but he asked for more and we were willing to give this, but he was not willing to test us. Phyllis, Andrija and John were all disappointed by this news. But in the same communication, there had been more encouraging news about Bobby. He has made a commitment, but under certain conditions, Tom said. In his heart, his commitment is made, but he is now trying to make us make a commitment to him. Things will be resolved and all our systems in motion by the middle of August. That was unexpected news for them. For when Phyllis had last seen Bobby in Orlando, he had not intimated that he was now willing to make his commitment to work with the group again. He had, however, to exercise his healing powers on Phyllis herself. On the 8th of July, Phyllis had had a heart attack. She had been in her office with two close friends when she had suddenly collapsed. They had driven her around to her doctor, who had immediately sent her to hospital where she was in intensive care for four days. When the worst of the crisis was over and she was convalescing, she had an argument with the doctor about smoking and by threatening to discharge herself from the hospital and convincing him that the stress she underwent without cigarettes was likely to cause a relapse. She managed to prevail upon him to allow her four or five cigarettes a day. The doctor therefore arranged for her to be moved to another room immediately next to the intensive care unit, where, although she was alone, she was still under continual observation, for she was wired to electronic monitoring equipment. She was supposed to be in bed all the time and call a nurse if she needed anything, but on the second day she got bored and wondered what would happen if she detached the belts that connected her to the electronic devices. She did so and nobody came to investigate, so she took the opportunity to go to the toilet. The next day she became more adventurous and left the room for about 20 minutes, 
take a shower, and still nobody seemed to have noticed her absence. She thought it was extraordinary and efficient, for a nurse was supposed to be keeping an eye on the monitoring equipment, and in the next room, and, but she wasn't supposed, disposed to complain, and she continued to enjoy her surreptitious daily excursions throughout the rest of her convalescence. She soon felt recovered. Among the tests she was put through, though, before being finally discharged, was on a running machine. Her heartbeat was monitored while she ran, and the doctor was amazed at the steadiness of the beat. And the length of the time that she kept up the running, he told her she seemed to have had more recovery, and that she had the heart of a girl of twenty. He was obviously very puzzled. The doctor and the hospital staff were even more puzzled on the day she left. Phyllis only had heard the story three days later from the superintendent of the nurses, who she was an acquaintance of. Apparently, after she had left the hospital, the electrodiogram had continued giving a readout of her heartbeat, as if she was still wired to the machine. Technicians were called to check the machine for faults. They dismantled it and put it together again, and still it went on recording Phyllis' heartbeat. It continued to do so, in fact, for eight hours after she'd left the hospital. Twice, twice while she was in hospital, Bobby had tried to get in to see her and managed to do so briefly on one occasion, masquerading as a relative who had come a long way to pay the visit. He had attempted to do a healing, but had been allowed little time, and it was doubtful that Phyllis' recovery was due to his efforts. There were so many unusual elements in the case that Andrija had asked for an explanation during the com communication he held alone with Phyllis on July the 17th. We are sorry that we had to inconvenience her, Tom said, but we decided this was the best way. We had much work to do. Phyllis had been getting too little rest and had been generating too much energy inward, which had weakened the heart. So we decided that this being needed to be brought down so that we could repair and fix the heart at the same time. Her heart was now as good as when she was a child, Tom went on, and its function and compositions had been changed. It is a method not known in your world, he said, and tried to explain that the heart now had nine sorts of antennae, which functioned both as, a sensors, as sensors and transducers. What it will do is filter the energy. Part of it will filter the energy, part of it is a satellite for us, and it filters and purifies the blood. Energy can then be dissipated into the ether without a blowout. Andrew G. asked whether the abnormal reactions on the hospital equipment were due to his energy, and Tom replied, this is correct. The energy that we use radiates out from this being. We have talked to you about, about the sonars, heart implants mentioned by Aria in the communication held at Stocking Island on June 21st. The sonar continues to radiate after it has activated. It is also the same principle as it is used in healing. When we use these beings for healing, healing, after the healing or the actual physical contact has taken place, then the healing continues. The sauna continues to radiate out for approximately 8 to 24 hours afterwards. Nobody in the world seems to have known about this, Andriji said wonderingly. Nobody before has hooked one of our beings into one of these machines, Tom said. In the same communication, Tom had spoken at some length about the relation between sexual and spiritual energies. Beings involved in the type of work they were all involved in, he had said, tended to activate sexual energy and desire to a high degree. It is obvious that we need tremendous work and help in this area, Andretta said, for it seems to be the main obstacle to our carrying out the commitments that we made. Tom said, you must realize that I do not understand that emotion. But he, but he apparently managed to get some help from colleagues after better acquainted with the problem of physical beings, for after a long pause, he went on. They are explaining to me that there is nothing wrong with this emotion, but it, if the being is not able to transmute the vibration, it becomes like a furnace that is stoked. And the furnace must have a safety valve. The refined way of doing this would be to elevate the energy or to walk off the steam. Within all of you there is a pipeline and if the energy is not funneled upwards so that the steam can be released properly, it then becomes a heart burning furnace. If you let off too much steam from the furnace, it dissipates the energy of that furnace 
and it no longer is functional as it should be. This is the problem in your physical world. There is too much involvement in releasing the energy instead of refining the energy. What this amounted to, of course, was an advocacy of sublimination instead of say, say, satiation, satiation of sexual desires. And though it was not particularly original, it was apparently particularly relevant to Andrija. For the following day, he made a decision to terminate a liaison he knew, which he knew had, had, been, in, had been jeopardizing his work. John also made a decision on the same morning, 20th of July. Here's how he describes it. Early in the morning while in bed, I got to thinking about my frustration with the wealthy people I know who claim to be committed yet still do not give money even though they know it's urgently needed. I realized that whilst I had given a lot of money, I had not in, do in, in so doing endangered my own financial security. So I had given nothing. I felt that that indicated some lack of faith in myself and in God, and that if I overcame that my frustration would go away, that if I, that if, and that if I overcame that, my frustration would go away. For it is of course frustration with, frustration with self and not with others. I also believe that money would only begin to flow from others when I dealt with my hang-ups about it. When I honestly faced my problem in this way, it simply melted away and I was overwhelmed with a sense of relief, joy and peace. There was indeed a need for further injections of funds into the work, not only to cover the considerable living and travelling expenses of the group, but also to carry out some of the projects were being mooted. In the communications taking understand in the communications, taking understanding that this is an honest and sincere effort and a pure love that we have for you beings. 97, uh, 97, sorry, so, sorry. In the communications taking place over the next few days, there was, to talk, there was a talk of making three films, one about Andrija's life, another about Asigilio Atsi, Asagioli, and the third, Tom said, will be about us, and it will include Bobby. And there was to be a research project launched with the children with paranormal powers and a TV program to be made on the subject. It was all work that would require some funding, and though John felt that, this, that his problem and his frustrations melted away when he thought about them, they were to reoccur at intervals in the future. The management seemingly understood and appreciated that Andrija and John both had resolved personal problems that had been affecting their work, for on the night on the 20th of July they held a party to celebrate the reaffirmation of their commitment. Early in the season, which was to be the weirdest they had had to date, and one of the longest, Tom said, This room is filled with our people this evening. We have come to surround you with the protection and with light. Because of the large number of extraterrestrials present, they were given to understand questions on a wide variety of topics would be able to be dealt with promptly, and they had process proceeded to take advantage of this situation. Among the points of information that their questions elicited in the course of the next hours were the following. That certain chemical amends, uh, elements take that a certain chemical element taken in very minute doses has the problem of heightening psychic powers. Both the element and its organic source were identified by name, but as it is a poison and has to be handled with great care, I have judged it advisable to withhold these details from the present narrative. That the structure of Christianity is in decline and will continue to decline. But there are groups within Christianity who disagree with the dogmatic aspects of the religion and will preserve its essential core. That the management have people attempting to do the work that is necessary place in all the governments of the major countries of the world except the Chinese. That the US and Russian governments 
have had a secret agreement for many years to suppress information about UFO sightings and contacts, but they were now going on to put under increasing they were now going to be put under increasing pressure by people demanding release of official information. That the telephone lines of the Osinin house were tapped by government agency, but there was no need to worry because we know how to erase. That the most reliable esoteric writings were those of the Tibetan, channeled through Mrs. Alice Bailey. That the group working with Yuri was still optimistic about getting him to come back into service, but we cannot make him change his decision. We can only try to inspire. If his ego is not tempered, there is not much we can do. Some other minor bits of information were conveyed then. Tom said, all of our people are now smiling. We are all around you. This room is filled. This house is filled and the top of your house is filled. We are very happy to be with you. You must understand that this is a party in your world. Perhaps John and I should address ourselves to this marvelous multitude and tell them how we feel, Andrita said. They would like to address themselves to you, Tom said. After a short pause, he delivered a celebratory speech. All this array of people and beings, because we are people, as you are people, is a gathering of all that have worked for many hundreds and thousands of your years in order to help you. Whether you realize this or not, we have come the farthest that we have ever come in order to help mankind. We are all very excited and exhilarated with being close to the completion of our project. In your time, it is short, but in our time, it has been very long, and we realize how short it has now become. As we look around this group that has gathered in your home, on top of your house, and outside your home, I see nothing but joy and peace and love that is being generated to all of you, and with all of this power that we bring to you and this love, we cannot. There will be no way that we can fail in this mission because at this time we have also on the planet Earth new physical beings that will help to see that we do not fail. This we have never had said before. We have never had the communication system that you now have, the awareness that you now have, and the openness that you now have. We are sad that some of you fail. But remember, in the past, everything failed. So we expected casualty rate. We do not like it, but we know that this is so. We would like you to keep in your hearts the understanding that this is an honest and sincere effort of a pure love that we have for you being. Profoundly moved, Andrija asked the reason for the celebration at this particular time and was told. <clears throat> the cosmic event that is going on is because of the final acceptance by our council that our project will be completed. This came about due to the work of you three. We are having a party of joy. You would use the expression dancing in the street. Moreover, the immediate course of the celebration the decision Andriji on John had individually made that morning would enable the work to be accelerated and ensure its eventual success. We would like to have your permission to introduce the being to, so to many that have come, the being being Phyllis. Tom said at the conclusion of the session, they there was a pause of a couple of minutes before Tom said that the session should now be ended and Phyllis brought back. Andrija slowly brought her out of a trance, out of her trance, and when she was fully conscious and Phyllis spoke with undisguised excitement and awe about the experience she had just been through, she kept saying there weren't the words to describe, but she managed to convey something of her vision, vision in a series of exclamations. 
My God, Andrija, they were outside this place. It was beautiful. It was absolutely glowing. And there were ledges and there were all kinds of people, but they weren't physical. And they had this glow. I was on the top of, of your house and all these people were surrounding this whole house. And they were smiling, beaming. The ledges were all around your house. What did they look like, Andrija said? Were they like people? No, not like people, not really, Phyllis said. She struggled to find the words. They had different forms, as if they came from different planets or galaxies or something. But they all had this smile. They were laughing and giggling and they were like kids. They were bobbling over and that had some, had just got too much of something or other. But there were some with long ropes and one took me by the hand and said, we want you to know that how many are working with you. And there are thousands and thousands and thousands. The ones in the robes were looking on like fathers or grandfathers, looking at their children and saying with pride, you've done it. The higher ones had such pride in their people. And Richard explained what had happened in the communication and about the party and the reason for it and how at the end, Tom had asked permission to take Phyllis to meet their what blasts my mind out, he said, is that here we are, just three ordinary little schmoes, and the council of the super galaxy chooses to drop in. They all laughed. It was just too incredible and beautiful, utterly preposterous, but totally believable. Because at the time, none of them had expected anything like this. And as Phyllis, in trance, was always quite oblivious to what she channeled. The correspondences between her experiences and what Tom had said were sufficient proof for Andrija and John that there really had been this intergalactic gap of beings around. Everywhere around them. There seemed no other way of expressing their mixed feelings of delight and amazement than, than just by laughter. Lyle had arrived that morning as a, arranged, but because of his decision not to get involved in the work of the group, he had not participated in this session. He had spent the past month in London at his home in, uh, and at his home in Bermuda and had devoted a lot of the work of the Essenian group and the questions of his own commitment and future work. Basically, he explained to me some time later, he felt that he had to remain a loner and could not work as a member of a group. His training and expertise were as a naturalist, and, and he felt that the earth had marvels and mysteries enough to engage him. And despite all the evidence, he could never be quite comfortable with the idea of intelligent super beings from elsewhere into earth's affairs. Nor could he see how he could ever be entirely satisfied that the communication came from an external source and not from the unconscious of one or more of the people involved. His respect for Andrija was immense, but he was convinced that he was also a shaman, a magic man, as he said, and was the key figure in the story. I took the opportunity to ask Lyle about the puzzling appearances of the, of the will. That really was a mystery, but he was not prepared to take it as proof positive of the existence of the management. He had investigated the incident. The will had been drawn up by solicitors in Johannesburg who said that they had received instructions from him by telephone. They had then posted the will to his home in Bermuda and it had come back with his signature on it, whereupon they had forwarded it to his parents. But, Lyle said, he had not made the phone call, he had not signed the documents and had not even been in Bermuda at the time when he was supposed to have returned it from there. He didn't see how anyone could have contrived such a hilobble hoax, or would have done so. And he admitted that it looked like a materialization event, conceived and executed by some intelligence, but even so, it didn't prove anything, and he was content to shelf it as an unresolved and probably insoluble mystery. His work in the Philippines and in Indonesia had accustomed him to living with the insoluble and the impossible. So Lyle was no longer a participant in the communication. Though he remained for several days as a sinning as a guest. On the day following the party, John and Adrija retired in the evening with Phyllis to Andrija's room to conduct another session, which involved around 
two questions that Andrita put to Tom at the start. What has been going on elsewhere on the planet the night before to cause the celebration? And what precisely was meant by preparing mankind for the landing? The first question Tom indicated showed that they still did not fully appreciate the importance of their role. They had to understand, difficult though it was to accept, that together, the three of them constituted the core for the work of transformation that was going to be done on the planet. Their function was that of a trigger or catalyst, and the previous night, there was not so much a global awareness as there was in the three of you a true commitment made. They had to remember too that they were really beings from another level who had chosen to come to Earth to do this work. John asked about this, his specific role. He well understood that Andrija and Phyllis had special abilities and experience to equip them for their work, but he didn't really understand what his contributions could be. Your balance and support for these two will be your main role, Tom said. Your love, your logic, and your balance. Andrija and Phyllis, because of their past work and experience, were in a habit of questioning, checking, and looking for proofs, which was right and good up to a point, but could be overdone, and John would serve the purpose of being more open and helping them to see that there are other things beside their constant striving for positive proof. So that they will not be so trapped. Alija could not be so concerned, should, Alija should not be so concerned as he was about the immensity of the task or feel that he alone was responsible for his accomplishment. Tom said, we had, we've set many things in motion on your planet. There will be many that will come to you. Doors will be opened. The advancement of knowledge will be very rapid. We will put these things into motion. We are helping you, Doctor. You have had knowledge and you've had faith in us for many years. Now have a little more faith in, under, in us and understand that this will not have to be done by you alone as it has so, as it has in the past. In answer to Andrija's question about the meaning of preparing mankind for the landing, Tom now gave a detailed description of the nature and purpose of the event. The landing would be a physical, visible event that would take place all over the planet over a period of nine days. Many different types of craft would land and beings would descend from them and be amongst men. Some would remain on earth as teachers and some would go on after a while to work in other areas. For then the planet earth would have begun to evolve in its truest sense. Thinking of the landing as the second coming, John asked, Will the beings that remain collectively represent the Christ, or will the Christ be among them? You must remember that all of you and all of us have the Christ within us, Tom said. It will be a collective consciousness. Man is now coming out of the true dark ages of the planet and becoming aware of the existence of other forms in other parts of the universe. Man have always out assure, assumed that there was something sitting up there taking care of their problems, but they also assumed through their ego that they were that they, they were the only existence, and that this being called God was only concerned with them. Man now has to understand that there are other forms of life, and that the universe does not evolve or evolve or revolve just around man. The beings that were going to come on to earth would bring technologies that would help man deal with some of the problems he was faced with. But their main purpose would be what, what we would call a spiritual one. It would be to raise the vibration of the souls to bring them out of darkness. And when we say darkness, we do not mean negativity, but true darkness. For they do not see and do not understand the cosmic. And they also do not understand that when they hate and they are angry, this creates a problem for the universe. Only by raising the level of the consciousness of this planet and 
perfecting the love and the core that is inside each human being, can we go on then to perfect other planets in the galaxy? This planet is one of the lowest that the soul comes to, to learn a lesson. The tragedy of this planet is its density. It is like a mire. It is sticky. And these beings get trapped in this stickiness. With your help, we are going to raise the level of this planet. Make it a higher planet, a lighter planet. The energy then coming from it will be sent into the universe and will help raise the levels of consciousness and the levels of other planets. We have spoken to you before of this being and young Bobby and their relationship in the etheric. Your planet will be raised to that type of vibration. So it's my dog snoring here. To prepare man for the landing, Tom now explained in specific answers to Andretti's question, meant to nullify his fear of other beings and bring him to awareness of their existence. The group must use their own initiative and knowledge of the world to work towards this end, but they would be helped in some ways. For instance, there was the project to interfere with the electronics of mass communication. This would make people ask questions. And at the time of the landing, the most stubborn non-believers would remember the interferences and thus be prepared to begin to understand what was going on. John and Adrija thanked Tom for this elucidation of the cosmic plan and their role within it. Tom then asked if they had any further questions and Andrija took the opportunity to raise the question of the proposed healing of Roberto Assetili. Tom said that the healing could and should be done it would require a number of sessions and the combined energies of three couples, Bobby and Phyllis, John and Diana, and Andrija and another female. But a distant healing would take a long time. It would be best if they could work on Asagio at his home in Italy. Andrija said that this was no problem and they would arrange to make the trip in the near future. Tom stressed that the most essential preliminary would be to secure Bobby's cooperation. It was partly an account of this that John and Phyllis went down to Diakotona Beach the following day. Also, in an earlier communication, Tom had said that John should go and talk to Bobby, and it was not necessary for Andrija to be present. So he did so and was delighted to find Tom's information confirmed. Bobby was willing to work with the group again and to join them on the trip to Italy and to work on Sicilia. Meanwhile, he and Phyllis would work together in Orlando for two or three weeks and then go up to Asinin, where it was proposed that they should all gather to hold further communications the second week in August. On this previous trip to Italy, John had chance to meet in a Florence hotel a filmmaker he had known in California, and they discussed the possibility of making a film about Asicili's life and work. So John now returned to Italy to discuss the project with Roberto as well as to be with Diana. And I stop this here, chapter four halfway.